screws, which, I, which will occupy us for the remainder of the time, the applications. And now I'm going to use those eight components to uh, find application breakthroughs. Uh, in the first, in the way of individual differences, we're seeing tremendous uh, energy and good efforts and good results in developing user adaptable interfaces. Interfaces that allow users to reset the color, change the messages, reorder the menus, change the sequence of screens, control the loudness of the sound, the brightness of the, of the, of the image, the handling of the keyboard or the mouse. I think this is extremely important. It enables us to accommodate different kinds of users as well as people with different kinds of handicaps. Um, uh, then within the task domain, and we're going to take a look at a few things here, uh, I will reference you also in the reading material, a paper of mine called Future Directions in Human-Computer Interactions has a, a section about each one of these areas and you can refer to those at your leisure. I think we've just begun to see the development of electronic mail and more advanced electronic office procedures. Uh, I think the emergence of facts is an indictment of our failure to do better on electronic mail. For every reason, I think electronic mail is a, a winning technology, but we failed to provide good graphics, good user interfaces, online directories, and uh, easy mechanisms for people to send electronic mail. I find it faster, cheaper, more, uh, more appealing if I can send mail, receive mail, reply easily, save it, sort it, extract it, search it, and uh, I can't do that with fax, but I can with electronic mail. I see great potential for medical record keeping um, and uh, for improving medical care for individuals as well as for society as a whole. The home controls has been the area we've gotten into doing a lot of work on, and I want to show you some of those applications. Uh, our enthusiasm for the touchscreen uh, remains, and I'll begin by showing you this touchscreen application we call Playpen, which is just simply demonstrates the graphic nature uh, uh, and the possibilities. Touchscreens are not for pressing buttons. Touchscreens are for dragging, painting, drawing. And um, if I uh, just start out here and I just say user, interface strategies 90 you can see how easily I can draw I can change to different pattern and uh, select a color and add some highlight or a frame to it and some fingerprints with changing the color or these raindrop effects and I find it just pleasant and fun to do this, and we've had many of our visitors comment on how they enjoy this. Now, this one is meant for uh, play, and it's called Play Pen, uh, but our attention has moved on towards applying the Play Pen ideas to practical environments, and that one, uh, that will take us to looking at the home control and automation application. The first one I want to show you uh, has to do with scheduling of home control devices such as burglar alarms um, and excuse me burglar alarms and um, VCRs ah. sorry about that this is a live demo and I'm gonna have to let's see I think I need to start this. Excuse me. Okay. All right, let me come back to that in a minute here. We'll come through. This is, uh, it's not Saturday night, but we are live from College Park. Uh, and uh, uh, the application we've been working on have to do with home scheduling approaches, such as um, uh, scheduling videotape uh, recorders, scheduling burglar alarms, lighting of the home, uh, heating, uh, and different control devices. We worked with a company called Custom Command Systems um, and uh, uh, to develop these interfaces, which they will be applying in their own products. Um, and uh, uh, we built four versions, one based on the traditional digital uh, interface, uh, of a digital watch or that's currently found in uh, 
um, applications uh, such as VCRs or microwave ovens. And uh, we built uh, t three other versions and we ran empirical tests. So I'm going to show you two of them. Uh, this one we called watches. And uh, this one was based on a model of the, uh, uh, what you've seen on some ovens here. And if I choose a start time, we have a clock put up front here on the touch screen. And I can grab the hands of the clock and turn the time or turn the hour hand to set the time I wish. There's an AM and PM toggle that I can switch from AM and PM. I can then set the stop time by the second clock and drag the hands around. People enjoyed doing this, and one of its strong points is that you could see really what was happening, that there were familiar 12-hour clocks, and the AM and PM toggles were close by. On the other hand, this method was not the winning approach, uh, because it turns out you need to make potentially a large number of touches, seven, to set something. And so let me go back and show you uh, the other approach, um, which offered the winning strategy uh, in our applications. Uh, it was called the lines approach, and we had a 24-hour representation of the timelines here. Uh, here, I select a calendar time, a calendar date like the 22nd. I get a 24-hour timeline. This approach avoided the confusion of AM and PM, and I could drag the on times here, and I would immediately see when the uh, device was set on, and I could drag the off flag and then turn it off. If I wished for something to go over a long weekend, for example, I could pick up that off and put the off flag down here, and you could see on the calendar that the device would be on for a period uh, over that three-day weekend. We could set many on and off switches uh, if we wish, and uh, this provided the most convenient way. There are only three touches necessary, a date, and then the two drags that set the times on and off. And this was most appreciated and had the least errors uh, of all the approaches that we tested. Uh, so we think there's great potential to do home automation uh, using these approaches. Uh, the uh, uh, next domain I want to focus on is the hypertext world, where I will show you our uh, Hyperbook, uh, which was published this year uh, by Addison Wesley. Uh, it's called Hypertext Hands-On. And uh, it, uh, uh, if you open it, you'll see there are two discs in the back. We hope if you get this, you'll uh, tear out the discs and throw away the book. The entire book is on these two discs and still more. And I'm going to show you some pieces of that book. If we look at the title screen here, We'll see it reflects the same image that we found on the title screen of the book there. Uh, we can go into this. Uh, and we've set the highlights to be rather bright so you can see them here. Users can control those highlights. This is the preface. All good books have a preface. It says, Welcome to Hypertext Hands-On. We turn to page two, and there's a list of some small hypertexts for us to explore. We'll take a quick look at the travel guide of San Diego. My co-author, Greg Kearsley, was from San Diego, and he made this little introduction to San Diego. The restaurants, places to stay, golfing, beaches, SeaWorld, and we'll take a look at the zoo, a little graphic to get us in there, and then the information that tells us the zoo is open daily from 8.30 to 7. Admission is $3. We can always go back to the previous screen, and we'll walk our way back to the preface. We could look at some of these other hypertexts, including the Hyper Joker blueprints and so on. We tried hard to make people laugh. Often they groan, but sometimes they laugh too. Uh, if I go to page three of the preface, we get a little more introduction to it. And page four already has a brief uh, table of contents of the chapters in the book, including a, a, a bibliography and a hyperglossary and an epilogue, which tells you the story, quite an adventure of us making this book and uh, the uh, efforts we got to make the publishing industry sympathetic to publishing electronic books. Uh, let me just take a quick tour into the introduction where we get a seven-page article about hypertext 
and we can turn to page two, three, four, and find out about different systems like HyperCard or HyperTize and important people like Ted Nelson or Vannevar Bush. Let's find out about Vannevar Bush. He was the first person to describe the concept of hypertext, and if we choose the article, we see a graphic of Vannevar Bush, and then the story of Vannevar Bush and his system called Memex. If we choose Memex, we'll find out it describes his system here, which was, the, which was first uh, uh, presented in an article called As We May Think. And if we select that, we'll get the full text of that article. We can just page through a bit of it here. And we see it was in the Atlantic Monthly, July 1945. I think Bush would have been pleased to see this kind of uh, presentation of full text of his information. If uh, I've gone too quickly for you and lost you, we can always turn to the extra facilities and look at the history of our session. We've gone through this sequence of articles and we could go back to any one of them at any time. Or we could use the index of all the 248 articles and we could uh, page through this index. Uh, we'd see some asterisks here which indicate we visited those articles already uh, and we could just turn our way through that index. Here's some more that the travel guide that we visited already. You can see there's lots to read here. Another way of overview is the table of contents, which is 13 screens long, and we can page through chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Oh, let me go back there. I guess this one about medical textbooks or a, uh, an example of hypertext that's been done uh, called the Dynamic Medical Handbook from Washington um, University School of Medicine. And if we turn the page, we'll see an extract from that on endotracheal intubation. This was using the note cards uh, system. And you get an idea of what that looks like. Uh, we could browse our way through this, but let me just show you one other feature of the system, which is the searching strategy. And if I type a string, just any string, like Maryland, uh, and look for all occurrences of this, we'll get a list which contains the uh, full set of articles. There are 11 of them out of the 248 that contain the string Maryland. And if we choose one of those articles and view it, we'll see there the word Maryland is highlighted and it's on page two. The system is turned directly to that page. So this is, gives us a way of getting around this kind of hypertext. We've learned a lot from this application. Uh, about the ways in which users can explore complex environments and uh, the ways in which they have difficulties and what tools and facilities will help people grasp the scope of what's there, but maybe more importantly, what's not there. One of the important challenges in designing a hypertext is to let, give people enough information so that they know that something isn't in the database. Uh, the applications of hypertext on PCs with small screens are fun and they're satisfying because they can be widely disseminated. But as I suggested earlier, larger screens and multiple windows really do make a difference. And now I want to take a look and show you how we've implemented Hypertize on the Sun workstation where we have somewhat larger viewing space. Can we have that videotape? Here we see the Hubble Space Telescope database uh, that was supported by NASA. And the index of the articles in the database are selectable as in the PC version. Here we have a graphic and the buttons are right on the screen. I can select um, to take the diagram of the Space Telescope and I can use this pie menu here to place it on the left-hand side or the right-hand side uh, and I'll choose the left side so that when I release, the image will come up on the left window here. And that gives us a detailed image of the Space Telescope. Uh, just to set some context, let me return on the right-hand side and select the introduction. And I'll put that up on the right-hand window. So now we have a complementary text that describes the Hubble Space Telescope on the right and the image of that telescope on the left. We could select information about the scientific instruments that are on the Hubble Space Telescope and read those articles uh, and uh, uh, find out about the wide field planetary camera, the faint object spectrograph, high speed photometer, and so on. Uh, on the main image of the Space Telescope, we can select the uh, items by their labels or uh, by the components uh, of the diagram itself, which appear to pop up in a three-dimensional fashion 
when the cursor rests on them. If I select by um, uh, pressing quickly twice, I'll get the image that's contained there, and I could find out more about that wide field of the planetary camera, or I could return to the previous image and choose to find out other things. In this case, maybe I'll select and place the image on the right-hand side of the screen, so when I release, we'll see the resulting content image there on the right-hand side. I believe that these kind of hypertext systems and hypermedia systems will provide very much excitement in the coming decade, and you'll be seeing more of those in presentations later today. Uh, these public access applications, I think, will expand. We'll be able to uh, find information in hotel lobbies and universities and libraries and so on. And I think we'll see uh, uh, nice applications because of these improvements in touchscreens. We've developed a touchscreen so that we can point to a single pixel conveniently and make it work reliably. Um, that same approach will lead, I think, to benefits to improve search strategies and flexible search, I think, are wonderful possibilities to search visual databases, music databases. I'd certainly like to be able to walk up to my stereo and hum a few notes, you know, da, 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 and receive a list of all the symphonies that contain that motif. I think we're not so far away from doing that if the uh, CDs contain the musical uh, text, uh, the musical notes in a representation that we can use. I think we'll be able to do much more elaborate searches. Uh, our own efforts focused on search in a hypertext environment, and I want to show you uh, this application, which was connected to our guide to volunteer archaeology. Um, that was installed in the Smithsonian Los Angeles County Art Museum is now in Ottawa. Uh, and in this case, we're looking for dig sites that we might want to join. Uh, in this mock-up of uh, the system that we're, or the refinement that we're adding to it, user can touch the months that they wish to travel. They can touch the countries that they would be willing to consider. Uh, and then they could touch this uh, uh, slider here to indicate the amount of money they'd be willing to spend and these kind of touchscreen environments where you, or the, uh, uh, where you or the items within each one of these units and then you and them across the blocks, we think can provide an effective way for doing many simple kinds of queries. And again, we have several museum applications that we're working on for providing this kind of uh, uh, access. Uh, so I, I think there's going to be a lot of fun in exploring databases in an easy and convenient way. The third topic about the collaborative uh, environments of collaborative meeting rooms and classrooms. We're seeing a lot of activity, people building classrooms as we are here on the campus of University of Maryland with 20 workstations uh, in a convenient way to support pedagogic uh, uh, applications. Uh, and just, I think there are a lot of commercial applications of that approach as well. If we move on to the center part of that comprehensive framework, perceptual, cognitive, and motor, there are other opportunities. I see the pressure for higher resolution displays is enormous. Everybody likes better screens, more readable screens, larger screens, better color, multiple windows, and the potential for animation. The windows issue is an extremely important one. I think we're just at the start of finding an explosion of ways to deal with multiple windows. In that Sun Hypertized version, I showed you a two-window browser where you could select uh, articles to be put either on the left or right side. Let me now show you a four-window version, or actually two variations on the four-window version of the browser. Can we have that videotape, please? window version of Hypertize was designed to explore two strategies for managing multiple windows. In this experiment, conducted by Jacob Lifshitz, questions were placed on the bottom of the screen. This database dealt with Austria and the Holocaust, and the question was, what was Adolf Eichmann's occupation before joining the Nazi party? We turn in the index, we can turn back page or next page in the uh, back page in the index, we find the article by on Eichmann, we select, and now we get a pattern which shows us the zigzag strategy of managing the windows. Here we confirm and we select in lower right. The article that we chose winds up here and the previous um, uh, screen winds up over here. Um, we could turn pages within this article. It's a five-page article. If we chose to follow any other topic, um, like uh, Joseph Lowenhertz, 
uh, we would again have the zigzag pattern. And now if we chose Anschluss, we would again follow the zigzag and the articles are now moving off the screen. If we chose Austria, we would keep moving the articles off the screen. This provides a very low cognitive load strategy. There's no decision making about where to do, to place articles. The new articles always come on the lower right and the articles move in a consistent pattern. If I bring them back by selecting the undo, then the articles retrace the path and uh, reconstruct the previous version. Uh, this proved to be a very simple strategy that our subjects learned rapidly and they worked with rather quickly. There was a certain frustration though of always having to select on the lower right uh, because sometimes there were terms they wished to select that were in other screens. Uh, to accommodate that style of uh, work, uh, the uh, next interface that I'm going to show you uh, allowed sele selecting in all four windows. In uh, this second version, all four windows were selectable. When the subjects would select the question, uh, uh, what was Adolf Eichmann's occupation before joining the Nazi party, they could, they could select any one of the index buttons and then turn the page here, choosing the article, and then they could select where to place it, either on the, lower, on the upper right, lower right, lower left, or upper left. So let's put it on the upper right. We'll put the article here. Now inside this article we could choose to turn the pages again uh, and if we chose to read about uh, uh, Austrian Jews we could place that article let's say on the lower left here uh, and we can ch choose another article like the one on World War II and place it on the lower right. So we have greater freedom in placement of the articles, but it does require one extra decision on the part of the users. In the study, uh, subjects overwhelmingly preferred this version because of the greater control that it gave them. Uh, but the extra decision that it took uh, required a little more learning uh, on the part of the subjects and a little more planning in organizing their um, reading of the articles, especially for complicated questions that required them to view multiple articles. Um, so in this situation, we have what we would call piles of tiles. These four windows are sort of a tiled layout and the, the articles stack up on top. And if we choose the undo, it will remove the most recent you know, the added page to the most recently added pile. So we could select and go back on any one of these. All right, those are two strategies that we did run an experimental study on, uh, but there are many other possibilities, least recently used or most recently used, and we have built other versions even on smaller displays where you can manage multiple windows in a convenient way. I'm a great supporter of the notion of doing things in a more uh, uh, tiled approach laid out on the screen uh, with not overlapping of the windows. I find myself annoyed to have to be moving the windows, sizing the windows, closing the windows, shaping the windows, bringing them forward and back. The first few days, it's fun, you know? It's nice and there's a sense of your power to do it and there's a joy in the three-dimensionality of, uh, of that interface. It's, it is fun, but I think uh, having a more stable interface and a more orderly presentation reduced cognitive load, reduced perceptual load, reduced motor load will be, the, uh, will be a more attractive approach uh, in developing um, uh, multiple window interfaces. So I see lots of good activity in window design and I'd love to encourage more of it. I think we can find some exciting ways, not just to manage five or six, but 40 windows at a time. I find myself annoyed when I have to close six or eight windows at a time. I want the windows to open and close as a function of the task domain not as a function of my manipulating one at a time. It feels like doing assembly language bit twiddling when I have to do each window one at a time. I want the task to govern that action. All right, well, there's a lot happening in the display world. Animation is another exciting topic uh, that I find just great fun. And again, we've just begun. We've just begun to do animations that are really attractive and informative. Uh, but let's move on to the general area of the visualization um, issue uh, where we're seeing a lot of interesting activity in scientific visualization and artistic visualization. 
Um, we could spend a week, and the SIGGRAPH conference is just that, a week of looking at wonderful uh, visual presentations. I'm going to show you a, a short presentation about ways to explore directories of information that take us from a textual presentation to a more visual orientation. Uh, this is Don Hopkins uh, showing uh, his uh, graphic demonstration. I might remind you these are quite simple examples he's showing you for pedagogic purposes. This idea does scale up quite nicely to still larger directory applications. Can we have that tape? This is a demonstration of the cyberspace deck and the pseudoscientific visualizer running under the news window system. We're going to use them to view a network of postscript data structures that represent the structure of the ARPANET as of 1985. Now, th this is uh, one view of the structure, and uh, what we use to model it in PostScript are PostScript dictionaries. Now, this is a dictionary here, and I can click on it to open it up and look at what it contains. And what it contains are, what it represents is an imp, an, uh, one node on the ARPANET, and it has its neighbors as keys in the dictionary. Now I can open those dictionaries up too by clicking on them and that's this is a whole network so it goes down deeper and deeper and deeper infinitely because it's a network and this could be maybe the path that a packet would take as it went from one end of the country to the other. So these data structures I can just open up parts of them on the screen, but uh, I can't, using this view, display large amounts of it at once, or I'll run out of screen space. And now that's what the pseudoscientific visualizer is for. It's what we'll do is open up a pseudoscientific visualizer on this top level ARPA imp. And the pseudoscientific visualizer is the object browser for the other half of your brain. It's a fisheye lens for the macroscopic examination of data. Now what we see here in the middle, this round thing, is that first dictionary. And growing off of it are the three neighbors of it in the network. Now I can click on one of its neighbors and bring that to the center. I've just increased the depth to which it will draw. It will just draw to a certain depth and then bottom out. Otherwise, it would keep drawing forever. Now, these, this uh, stick sticking out here is the name of the node, like ARPA imp, DCEC imp. That's a string data type. Different data types are drawn differently here. Now, um, I can increase the depth even more let's say to six, and make this window a little bigger so it will redraw. And it draws a compound object as a circle, and then it recursively draws all its elements scaled smaller in an evenly spaced ring rotated around the circle. The deeper an object, the smaller it is, and it'll only draw to a certain depth that you can even change while it's drawing. So we'll decrease the depth here. so that it will finish up. Uh, this shows form, texture, density, depth, fan out, and complexity. As you can see, there, there are clumps of nodes. Now, the highlighting that's going on is showing me where these uh, nodes are under the cursor. And I can press the button on the background to get an x-ray view of what is displayed and light up all of the mouse sensitive nodes. Now, any of these nodes I can press on to bring to the top. Or I can point at it and click the button and it will tell me just what this object is. So I can annotate a few of these. It just drags out a hand and pops up the little window. So this is sort of a, a link back to the other half of your brain. 
Okay, that gives you some idea of the possibilities, and we're, kind, we're, we're continuing to explore. If you notice that the different shapes indicated different types of data, and the sizes also had meaning, their relationship to each other, the length of the, the uh, stick figures gave an indication of their importance. We show the second part of that, where you'll just see a quick color, uh, and a very nice example of one for code browsing. As it gets around, We'll get to other data types. This is a null. This is an, a number. This, this plug is a null. The square is a number. The triangles are keys. This circle with a dot is a dictionary. Um, this stuff looks like code here. Yes, this is the menu class because code is arrays with numbers, operators, constants in it, and other arrays. And it looks pretty distinctive. Now, the colors that it's using to draw are varying sort of randomly. The color of an object is a little different than the color of its parents, so that all of the children of an object will be close to the same color, but different. It's nice to have the children in different colors, so that if you have a lot of things overlapping, you can at least see the edges. And now lastly, here's drawn the array of menu items that we can see down here, stuff, user interface, repair. So these lines here are strings, and the length of the string is the length of the line. So if I want to point at this and say, what is this funny looking thing here? It will let me put a little pointing hand displaying it. Okay, well that's one kind of visualization, and we're trying to see if we can show what is in large directories, such as might be on a hard disk or might be in a rich form of hypertext, uh, because it's very hard to show that kind of tree structure. It quickly fills the screen. And other attempts to show node and link diagrams just expand off the screen, and so people have to shrink or move. This approach does have a fixed size to the display. No matter how deep or rich, it is a fixed size. It does get smaller and smaller, but you do get a perspective and you do get a visual sense of what this device is, what, what, what is the content of this directory. Some of those displays are more vivid and more apparent what's going. You could see some of them did get quite cluttered and it was hard to find out what's going on. Many other kinds of uh, scientific visualization have been attempted. Uh, and the tape I want to show you next uh, is one that was given to me uh, courtesy of Mike McGreevy of NASA. It was created by Kevin Hussey. It's a, a tour of Mars. Uh, and I think you'll find it a very exciting uh, visual reconstruction of what it might be like to fly over the surface of Mars. Um, can we have that tape? Among the most impressive features on Mars are the Thasus Montes, shield volcanoes more than two times the height of Mount Everest, and the Valles Marineris, a system of enormous canyons over 3,000 miles long. This Viking orbiter image mosaic was used for the flight simulation. The line being drawn follows the flight path. Flight elevations vary from 500 miles to three miles above the surface. The relief has been exaggerated five times and the natural color enhanced to allow better interpretation of small surface features. For centuries, Mars has captivated observers on Earth. Unmanned spacecraft and scientific data visualization have increased our interest in and knowledge of the Red Planet.
for those of you who have never been to Mars, uh, that, that's just a terrific view of the place that I just, uh, just I find that compelling, all reconstructed computer graphics. We're going to take a look in a moment. I'm going to close with this section on digital photography and do a little demonstration of that. I just want to note other advances in the world of cognitive issues of remote control, in home controls, but also industrial and others, to do it there and do it then. Remote in time, remote in space. Our own work about replaying history to redo things that you've done before. I think our other opportunities, motor devices, input devices, touch screens, uh, data gloves, full body motion are, are all being developed. And in the affective domain, I think we're going to see humorware and hyper jokes, romance novels, and maybe even a little hyper sex along the way too. Uh, cultural uh, phenomena also, I think we'll find increasing attention to national language support and uh, uh, to control panels to let people in diff different cultures choose the way they'd like to see uh, their displays. Uh, and I think there are many other deeper issues in the cultural world that uh, uh, will be attractive to us. I promise to close uh, with this uh, demonstration about digital video. It's been one of my uh, photography pleasures um, to have uh, this display. Can we have it back on me here? Just let me show. This is a, a device called Canon Zapshot. It is a digital uh, photography uh, system which has little floppy disks uh, which uh, contain 50 images stored magnetically. I simply put that in the camera which acts as a display and um, it's, uh, I, I can then give you a little tour of the campus of the University of Maryland. This is the camera for taking it and the entire device for showing also. A uh, little introduction to the campus, the steeple that's well known, some views of it, uh, the fraternity row, the red brick and white column design, uh, the Rossboro Inn, the classic colonial period piece, uh, other buildings on campus. I thought I'd show you this little tour of McKeldin Library in a quick continuous sequence. Um, and then we go over to the famous floral M on the campus and the engineering building, the computer science building, uh, where in our human computer interaction lab, people are joyously at work on all of these projects that I had the chance to show to you today. It's been my real pleasure to uh, work with this bunch. And today you're going to see Joy Mountford, Aaron Marcus, Jack Carroll, and our group over here. So uh, I think this device uh, is fun, uh, but I think it makes a very attractive medium for 